You know, there's an old saying, behind every man is a good woman. Well, the story you're about to watch is, is really truth and testament to that. My mom, Dolores Linder and Mary Linder were really instrumental in the success that my dad, Ron, and Al Linder had. Uh, they stuck with them through thick and thin, and there was a lot more thin times than there were thick times. So this piece is dedicated to you, my mom, Dolores, and my Aunt Mary. Just add it to my collection. How many bass have you caught in your life, Alphonse? Oh, that's an easy one, Ron. Not enough. Got him, Al. Right where he's supposed to be. <laughs> Not a big one, though. It's all, well, it's good. Just the back. Nice fish. Nice fish. Nice I mean, today is the really, as far as sport fishing goes, we're sitting in the best days this sport has ever seen. I, I mean, fishing today is phenomenal. The, the resources are managed great. Yeah, you know, we've got more big muskies than ever before. Phenomenal walleye fishing all over the country. Bass fishing is rebounding everywhere. Smallmouth fishing is off the charts. Just to name a few. I mean, the fishing is incredible. So, I mean, you, you com combine the tackle, the equipment we have today, the knowledge, the management of the resources. There's no reason to not be out catching fish. You can learn how to do it. There's plenty of fish in your backyard where you're at right now. And don't be afraid to try different kinds of fishing. It'll make you a better angler. Don't only be a hardcore tournament bass fisherman. Go do some cat fishing. Go do some crappie fishing now and then. If you're a musky guy, take a break. Go catch some walleyes. Go catch some smallmouth or vice versa. All of it keeps you tuned, keeps you in love with the sport, and I guarantee you it makes you a better angler. Okay, here's the deal. It's 12 o'clock exactly, July 3rd. It's like 95 degrees out. Everybody in our office is out fishing. Jeremy's chasing muskies, Jimmy's chasing bass, Ryan, I think, went crappie fishing, McAnally's going cat fishing, uh, uh, Dave Sanda, uh, I think they went walleye fishing along with Mike Hayner. I mean, everybody's out jerking jaws. Bob Backlow's pre fishing for a tournament. I don't know what Danny's doing, doing. He's probably bluegill fishing. But in any case, Ron comes in the office today. He says, you know, we haven't fished together for a couple weeks. I got on a good bite the other day. Let's go jerk some jaws. I was out with Nikki and we caught a few. I told him, Nikki, we got to get off this spot. If we pull too many, Danny and Jimmy and Al are going to get mad. That's a switch. Usually, they go out and they tell me the next, next day, guess what, we caught 40 bass to five pounds today. And I think to myself, man, that would have made a tremendous television show and all the fish got holes in their mouth. This time, they left a few for us. What are we gonna talk about today? I don't know, just join us and we'll see. Playing hooky, you might say? Cutting out of work to go fish? Nah. If that's the case, Ron and I have been playing hooky for years and getting away with it. In all actuality, there's a lot more to our job than just catching fish and enjoying the weather. Our marketing partners rely on us to take, test, and report on new products. Everything from cold weather gear to the compartments and boat design. And along the way, we keep a pulse on the fishery and have an intimate relationship with the DNR, working in concert to maintain a healthy fish. It feels right so over good, here. Ronald. Nice fish, boy. Really, really nice fish. Here she comes. Oh. That's the kind that I like to catch. That's the kind that I like to catch. Yeah. I mean, she was solid. Just a nice chunker. Just a nice, nice chunker. Oh, man. Look at that baby, huh? Ooh, feel good. Feel really, really, really good. You know, about two weeks ago, I was doing a promotion, an in-store promotion. Let me put her back. I was doing an in-store promotion for all of our marketing partners. And, and I was there for, you know, probably four or five hours. And I'm talking about walleyes and muskies and largemouth and smallmouth, da, da, da. And uh, uh, we've been doing this our whole life, many, many years. And you get a handful of questions that never change, no matter if you're north, south, east, or west, it makes no difference, sport shows, whatever. And one of the questions that, that is universal, naturally, is, hey, what's your favorite fish? One of the other ones is, what is one of your favorite lures for this or that kind of fish? And then, naturally, 
what's your favorite lake for walleyes or muskies or largemouth bass or something like that. Your lake, your presentation, your favorite fish. And the other question that is somewhat universal might surprise you. And it happens a lot. Hey, do you ever get tired of fishing? <laughs> Well, Ron and I am fishing with my brother, Ron, and we've been fortunate enough to make a living in the sport fishing industry our entire lives. And uh, what I'm gonna do is give you, we wanna take a, a little while here, give you a little background on us, where we came from, what, what, what we've done in the industry, catch you up to where we are today, and then we're gonna share some more things that by the end of this show, well, we'll probably let you answer that question yourself. To stuff 50 wild and woolly years into a few minutes will take some doing. From our start in 1963 as the Linder Lure Company in Chicago until today as Linder Media Production, we would take a few weird bends in a row. By 1965, Al and I had already fished a number of tournaments, which were just beginning. We're also selling lures, giving seminars in stores, legion clubs, and sports shows. Uh, and writing for some sports publications as well. In 1966, while waiting for Al to get back from Vietnam, I and the family moved to Rhinelander, Wisconsin, in preparation to buy a combination fishing resort and bait shop. But I guess the Lord had better plans for us, because the deal imploded. While waiting and living in Wisconsin, however, I did devise a walleye catching concept that later became known as the Lindy Rig and uh, developed the back trolling system. With Al's return from the Asian War, he, my growing family and I, moved first to Mount Amidi, Minnesota. Here we continued to write articles and sell lures to mail order. In 1967, we moved to Brainerd, Minnesota and began guiding and selling our lay bait rig idea under the name of the Lindy Rig. In 1970, in order to sell more of our lures, we began an outdoor television show. We also took on a partner, Nick Adams, and adopted the name the Lindy Lure Company, and off it went. The company grew quickly, but we were undercapitalized, so in 1974, we sold the Lure Company. By what some folks might call serendipity, but we call the leading of the Lord, we stumbled our way into the publishing business. This was the beginning of the in-fisherman era of our lives. Al is now married and has a family and mine has expanded. For the next 27 years, the in-fisherman would blossom into a full-fledged communications network that grew to include a library series of books a stable of magazines, a syndicated radio show, a multi-network television program, a camp for kids, a professional walleye tournament, a newsletter, and adult fishing school. At this point, a big conglomerate that was expanding into the outdoor field made us an offer we couldn't refuse. So, we sold the business in 1998. But we loved to fish so much, so when Al finished his work contract with the new company, in 2002, we both said it's too early to go in. So let's stay out and make a few more casts. But this time we did it with our children, grandchildren, new and old friends, and let them do most of the work. So today, one decade later, as we celebrate our 43rd consecutive year on television, we have Linder Media Productions, which is still a work in progress. My earliest fishing memory is fishing with my mother. Actually, my dad liked to fish, but my mother was the real fisher person in the family. And she used to, remember, this was the days before outboard motors, we were rowing. So she'd take Ronnie the rower out in the boat with Granny, she said, cane poles, we had cane poles with bombers, and we fished panfish primarily, crappies. And she would take Ronnie the rower, I actually had blisters on my hands from rowing with old Granny. And she'd take me out and I would go out there with the cane poles, we'd anchor up and uh, we'd fish, we'd head live bait and we would fish crappies. And that was my earliest memory of fishing and uh, fond memories they were indeed. That's interesting that uh, Ron mentioned my mom. Uh, uh, she was an inspiration to me too because of her love for fishing. I mean, she would really, really enjoy it. My dad, he'd go fish a little bit. But another thing 
that I, I noticed, and she shared that with me. You know, I grew up on the streets of Chicago. Ron and I came from Chicago, ended up migrating to Minnesota, and, you know, built a number of businesses, and like I said, made our living in a fishing business. But when I was a young kid, about 11, 12 years old, I knew I was going to make a living fishing. I knew it. And uh, uh, when you hear the musings of a 11 or 12 year old kid say that, yeah, you know, she didn't look at that that like that was some silly question that, that yeah, you know, some silly thing that a kid dreams about. That, yeah, how are you going to do that growing up on the streets of Chicago? And she would buy at Christmas time. Uh, because Ron was pretty in, into the fishing tackle and what is new and what's happening, you know, in the world of fishing. I had an extremely wealthy uncle who loved to fish, and uh, he would take Ron and I on some great fishing ex extravaganzas. And uh, they would share with my mom, like for birthdays or Christmas or something like that, I had the absolute best fishing equipment money could buy. The most modern, up-to-date equipment you could possibly get. And that, that was an important part of nurturing that fire. They seen a fire in the heart that wasn't just a, a natural, just, just something some kid was playing with. There was more to it than that. And they never said, that's a stupid, silly idea, kid. Yeah, yeah, you know, go get a real job. They nurtured that. And for that, I am forever thankful. By the way, Al, outside of your paid stint in Vietnam, have you ever had a real job? Other than a little tour of duty working for Uncle Sam for a couple years, you know, I was on his payroll <laughs> and uh, got a little paid vacation to Southeast Asia, you know, some interesting things there. But that's another story. The fishing there was a little bit different <laughs> than it is here. But no, I've, I've made my living in this fishing game all my life. And, you, you know, Ron and I both have no other interests. There's two things that motivate us. We don't hunt, we don't play golf, uh, uh, we don't uh, run, we don't bicycle ride, nothing like that. Our two passions are really simple, and it has been all our life. It's fishing and the industry and business of fishing. There is not a day that goes by that we don't think about it, talk to somebody about it, read something about it, watch something about it, go on the internet and look at what's happening at a, a particular tournament, follow things in the in industry. It is a burning passion for both of us. And the other, ha the other uh, element that's a, a, a part of our everyday life is our faith. Our trust in God, God, the Bible, and uh, we regulate our, uh, our lives and our businesses by that principle. And we're happy campers because of it. Yeah, I got, Al had good equipment. Actually, when I was in the service, I was stationed in Europe and Germany in 1952-3. Uh, I picked up some Mitchell reels. This was spinning reels. Prior to this, I never saw anything like this. It was actually a Mitchell reel from the Mitchell plant in France. And I bought, I think it was four or five of the reels, and I sent them home. And Al loved them. I, he, he didn't know how to mount one. One, he had them upside down and, and uh, when he first mounted. But when I came home, we started fishing. We were fishing spinning rods early on in the game. And uh, they were already around, but uh, open face spinning reels were, were still hard to come by in, in the early 50s. And we were already on it like a hawk. We got a mono line early. I don't remember the year, but I picked that up as soon as I could. I don't remember the years. We had one particular time in 1957. There was a uh, an incident, I call it the opening salvo of the modern angling revolution. There was a, uh, Buck Perry came to Chicago to do a uh, series of uh, seminars and, and uh, promotions. They went to a lake in northern Illinois, and they caught fish like you couldn't believe. I, like I couldn't believe, for sure. Most other people couldn't believe it either. They had the famed uh, writer Tom McNally and Ray Gray with some of the local papers. And what he did, what do you got there, El A good one, or? I can't tell. See that bait flush up there? Yeah, I saw I'm it. sorry to interrupt it, your, your historical fact there, Ron. Well, I'll pick it's it up. It's a little guy, let me just skip him in here. Okay. All right. Okay, pick up where you where you left off because that that's kind of the story of modern angling today. And we were again fortunate enough to be in the right place 
at the right time. And more importantly than that, looking, you were starved for information. You wanted to know more. You wanted to find out how to catch more of these. And that's the, you know, that burning desire. What can I do to get one more bite in a given day? And, and for me, well, that's another story about the fish biting or not biting. I won't even go there, because you can always catch fish. That, that is a bunch of bull, but I'll let you get back to your story, right? As I was saying with the story, Buck was there, and he showed up at a Klein Sporting Goods. This is a sporting goods store, a chain of, of stores in Chicago. And he was selling these spoon plugs. And in the store was a new product that they just saw. It was called a depth finder, a locator. It was Red Box, I think, at the time. At that time, it was Red. And, uh, I looked at this thing, it was 150 bucks, and I says, I gotta have one. Now, 150 bucks in 1957, I don't know what it's worth today, but it's, you know, it'd be a thousand bucks for sure. And I just looked at this thing and I could, I could blink. At the time, I was making $80 a week. And uh, I, if that, if that. And uh, I really wanted one of those. At any rate, when, when I bought these spoon plugs, I took them back and I, literally tried to fish them and I didn't do too well but there was a booklet in there it talked about structure fishing and to look for structure and I read the I literally threw it away and it, it, the book I thought it was just a, a it, it was called a spoon plugging lesson and it was laying uh, on the bottom of the car there and I picked it up later after we didn't do so good with the lures and I read it and I started learning about structure for Al and I this was an eye opener of eye opener. We eventually got a hold of a depth finder. And with the concept of structure that we learned that fish relate to structure, and here was a machine to find it, this was opened up a whole new world to us. We were on a different road. Later, Bill Bakelman, the famed Bill Bakelman, he came to that uh, 1957 uh, show at Klein Sporting Goods as well. And later he got Buck to come to Milwaukee with him and he opened up a paper called Fishing Facts or Fishing News is what it started out and later became Fishing Facts magazine. These were all the first shots in the modern angling revolution. And shortly after that tournament fishing came on the scene and uh, the first organized big events were the World Series of Sport Fishing and uh, Ron and I got exposed to that. I, I qualified for one regional championship. This was just before I, I was just a kid getting ready to, to go into service fresh out of school. And then shortly after that, bass came on the scene and I started to fish uh, bass tournaments. Uh, I fished the second BASS tournament there ever was. You know, early part of, of ba the bass fishing tournament scene. I, 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 well, I, I won two tournaments, fished three classics. You know, got a taste of tournament fishing. Uh, I started to fish walleye events, and uh, uh, the rest quickly became history. It became part and parcel of the learning curve. And the key to all of it, and I can't stress it enough, is to always be on the front end of whatever is happening. You don't want to be three years down the line, be the guy going to your favorite lake to start trying drop shotting three or four years after the fish have been fried on it, and there's a whole new presentation working already. You want to be on the front end. So watching television shows like this, uh, uh, reading magazines, there's a ton of stuff today on the web that is worth its weight in gold and the transfer of information. You could find out what's happening, where, when, and how at the click of a button, so to speak. Uh, uh, the ability to learn today what took us 10 years, in a lot of cases, you could find out today in one year. Less than that if you're really motivated. In the 50 years I've been active in the sports fishing game, let me tell you, outside of some little pockets here and a little pockets there, generally speaking in North America, the fishing is the best it has ever been in a half century. There are more big muskies, more big smallmouths, more big bass, more big walleyes being caught than ever before. Yes, uh, there's, there's little pockets of problems here and there, but by and large, the fishery as a whole is better than it's ever been. And don't let anybody fool you as far as that. I, why? I've been there. I know what it was. I know what it is. 
and the comparison is like night and day. You see the size of that one, Ron? Look at what? this. Topping. Topping. Look at that. Oh, it ain't dinks out here. I come back, I fish. First, look at that. First fish came on a, a Texas rigged uh, Trigger X. And I came back a little bit shallower, you know, put on a topwater bait on these hot, really hot, muggy days like this. You know, it's amazing in so many of these lakes that they're clear water lakes. These big bass, boy, she's got it. She's got it down her throat. These big bass like this will get under these giant bluegills. Ron, I gave you the, I gave you the players. You got to give it back to me. Got him out, right where he's supposed to be. <laughs> eh, not a big one though. It don't. Yeah. Well, a good fish. Just a bat. Nice dead. fish. Nice fish. Just nice a fish. fish. Ah, there it is. Whew, that's a good one. Let me get her back in this warm water. You don't want to keep them you know, sitting out too long, that's for sure. You know, in the 50 years or so, I guess, that Ron and I have been fortunate enough to, you know, do fat. what we've done, we've seen a lot, a lot of things come and go. Different lures, electronic technologies, a line. I mean, we've seen about every revolution you can imagine that has impacted the sport of fishing. And I think one of the things not do I think, I know that one of the things that really keeps an angler ahead of the game is being aware of all of the new toys that are available out there and uh, 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 putting them to use. Anytime you hear somebody say, you know, I don't watch those television fishing shows anymore. I don't read those magazines. They're a bunch of baloney. That's a bunch of hype, da, da, da. I don't need to go to that sports show to listen to a seminar. I know all I got to get. I'm catching all the fish I need. You know, all those gadgets, they're made to sell fishermen and, and not catch fish. Da, da. Anytime you hear that, I can tell you a fact. You limited your ability to be a good angler, pure and simple. The day you think you've got all of the technology and all of the answers to everything, you are not catching nowhere near the amount of fish you can catch because there is always something to learn, always. And that's what's been a driving force for both Ron and I. It's been so much fun to experience new things. It keeps you on your toes. It really does. It's one of the most exciting aspects of the sport. You know, let me take a moment here. I'm gonna show you a few things that our marketing partners, the people that sponsor and make this show possible, have come out with this year. Some of it, I think, might even blow your mind what is happening. Today's boats and motors are bigger, faster, and safer than ever before, loaded with features that make fishing more efficient, effective, and fun. Premium fishing boats sport fuel-efficient hulls, superior live wells, tons of storage, and enhanced fishability, and they're powered by large motors that get you to your fishing spots and back again while idling down slow enough to troll effectively, even at super slow speeds, Minn Kota's iPilot Link technology interfaces their autopilot steering technology with Hummingbird's GPS navigation and Lake Master's amazingly accurate on-screen lake maps. We even have side, down, and 360 imaging at our fingertips, revealing incredible underwater detail and leaving fish nowhere to hide. Rods and reels are more ergonomically designed, becoming lighter and more compact without sacrificing sensitivity, strength, and power. We work with Quantum to design Linder's Angling Edge Technique Series rods, matching rod lengths, actions, and powers to a wide range of popular fishing tactics. Fishing lines run the gamut from premium monofilament to tough invisible fluorocarbon to space age super lines like Suffix 832, which combine thin diameter with strength, sensitivity, and performance. Nowadays, you match your lines to fishing conditions, not just your lures. And speaking of lures, nobody beats the folks at Rapala for earth shaking product introductions. Their new BX series combines the lively action of balsa with a durable outer polycarbonate coating 
And their Ike's custom ink colors have propelled the Rapala DT series crankbaits to the forefront of the bass fishing world. BMC hooks, jigs, and rigs sport a variety of innovative features designed to catch more and bigger fish. Terminator's titanium spinnerbaits and Storm's UV bright finishes are revolutionizing fishing for everything from bass to muskies. And Trigger X soft baits continue to rock the fishing world by proving that live bait isn't always the answer for catching more and bigger fish. Like I said earlier, in fishing, nothing stands alone. We tirelessly work with our marketing partners to help design, refine, and imagine the next generation of fishing products, and to bring the best technology for catching fish to the next generation of upcoming anglers. The way I like to approach a lot of these deep weed, weed edges, like a lot of the natural lakes that we're on now, the top of this flat is about eight, nine feet of water and uh, uh, the weeds will go down all the way into about 16. You know, and I come on a structure, I'll take the first pass and I fish the deepest edge first. Then I'll move up into them a little bit, take it back at another level, and then I'll get right up on the inside of the weed lines in the top. And you'd be amazed at on a lot of days in these natural lakes, you can catch a fish or two down here, a fish in between, a fish inside, you catch one on a buzz worm, you might catch two on a flutter worm, one on a top water, one cranking. And this time of the year, this happens a lot in these lakes. And these lakes, the natural lakes that we fish, the main forage is bluegills and crawfish in a lot of these little lakes that I'm on here now. And this time of the year, this top water bite, we did a show on this some years ago, but it's one of the best kept secrets in the North Country, how hot this thing can be. On these hot, muggy days, these bluegills will come up and suspend over the tops of these deep weeds. A lot of cases out off the weeds in 25 feet of water away from the weed line. And you take, I don't know why, they really like a popper. For some reason, a popper in these conditions on these lakes will draw them up. Now you're fishing it kind of slow. You don't fish it real fast. You throw a jump bait, you won't catch near the amount of fish as you can catch on, on a popper. You know, a lot of times, look, in the middle of the day, those big fish will get on that top water bite. By the way, my son just came back from fishing a, a Lucas Oil Tournament on Lake, Lake Mead. Middle of summer, 110 degrees. And it's not 110 today, but it's got to be pushing 100. And uh, the guys that won that event in a lot of the higher places, guess what they caught the fish on? Top water baits, crystal clear water, me, 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 it's got zebes in, in, in it. Fishing topwater baits over these big suspended points. Middle of the day, throughout the morning. Yeah, you know, a lot of topwater anglers, they think, man, I gotta get, you know, it's all a low light bite thing. Now that isn't really the case. I'm gonna keep fishing down around the point now, Ryan. The water right now is about as warm as these lakes get. Oh, Ryan, look at this one. Coming up, coming up, coming up. Ugh, I love this, I love it. You gotta really leave that thing set. She ain't a giant, but she ain't bad. And she ain't bad. One of my all time favorite poppers. This baby is an X-Rap pop. You know, the size and shape of this thing has really been good. The last few years, you're watching a lot of our shows, you've seen it catch a lot of these babies on this bait. You know, she really, really spits. It's the day before 4th of July. Surface temp on this lake in Minnesota here is 86 degrees. That's the surface temp. You get down a little bit, and you might be having a little, uh, you know, might be uh, maybe 76. Uh, you got that real thick layer, but this is as hot as it gets. This is as warm as it gets. Oh, I had him. Let me come back again. Yeah, yeah. I've got to have to go to top water, Al, I guess. <laughs> No, I, don't, I don't know how long it's going to take you to do it, but, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, okay. but I, I can't fight it anymore. I wouldn't fight it if I was you. You put on, yeah. 
put on the Rapala. Uh, I got a number of the right colors in there. Yeah, you know, when they get on that top water bite like this is really, yeah, you, you know, amazing. You take that X, you take that X pop and, and you work it really, really slow. And, and, you know, this time of the year, I think what a lot of anglers do, they're thinking this water is so warm, it's so hot, and I've seen this wait, wait a ton of times. Yeah, you know, they think everything has got to be deep, the deep weed lines, they'll let me get out on a rock, start cranking. You know, and in many cases, you're fishing underneath the fish. Lots of cases. You're actually under the fish. Not well, that we don't catch some fish doing it. Well, I ain't getting nothing but, out of these baits. I just went to a, a bit of the tackle box here, and I keep on saying, well, they'll bite on this, they'll bite on that. Well, they ain't. So I'm looking for the top water. Interestingly, I reached into his box. You see that number? You know what that means? This is a test lure that they gave us when they were first designing, before they came out with the X-Pop. These were still designed and they were coming. These were different weights and different types. This four is a certain, it has certain characteristics when they were, were doing the test models and we were breaking the things in. This is what they sent us from Finland. You'll notice over here, it has a different number on it. So you're seeing the real testing things that came from Finland, I'm gonna put it on. They got the regular stuff out, now you can buy the regular ones in the store, but I still got one of these test things. The reason that I kept that bait in there, that is the final design of, of, of the product that you're buying in the store today. Yeah, you know, the, how it sits in the water, how it spits on different pound test lines, we did a lot of work with it. The right hooks, the right split rings, the right everything. So that bait hooks right, lays right in the water when it's dead sticked. You got, that, that's, a, that's a collector's item, Ronald. Don't I, lose that bait. I know that. He takes all my good baits like that. That bait is gonna be worth a lot of money one of these days. You better not lose it to a northern. Boat just passed us, got a pontoon boat there, got a water skier there, got a jet bike there. Weekend coming up holiday weekend coming up hotter than blazes. You know, we are the only people fishing on this lake. Everybody else is boating, doing something else. We actually, we got this lake to ourselves. Totally, totally to ourselves. It's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. This is the day before 4th of July. Uh, a lot of these people are up for the for the holidays. So you can see them all over the place there. But they've been pulling water skis off. We are the only boat fishing on this entire lake. That just tells you something. You, can, you don't have to get, you don't have to go up to the North Woods only to catch fish. You can catch them up there, but you can catch a lot of them right near home or, or in these city lakes. So, okay, Ron. Ooh, just Ron. keep that in mind. Let's see, she's coming, she's coming. Uh, that one. That one was a bottom fish. That feels so good. It feels so good. It feels so good. <laughs> Come here, baby. Come here. These fish are looking really good. Really, really good. You know, I got to tell you something. Let me get this hook out of here. Look at how clean they look. Nice, clean fish. These deep water fish have not been been worked over. And, you know, there's no holes in their mouth or anything, and that's a good thing. Yeah, you know, Ronald, he's, he, for some reason, reason, he doesn't like to say anything about this, but he's gonna be 80 years old. Uh, he wants to keep that a secret. And he's my inspiration. He's 10 years my senior. Okay, you know how many days a year that dude fishes? Pushing about 200 days a year. Spends his winters down with his buddy Dick Sternberg, who we, we've done some television shows with, and they fish all over Florida, you know, in the winter, ch chasing snook and redfish and trout and everything else. And, you know, I don't quite push 200 days a year, but I know that I do 180 days a year. While he does the Florida scene, I do the Southwest. And uh, uh, we, every year over the years, we generally, you got him? 
He's no. got them. No. Uh, we pick different uh, uh, parts of the country and, and uh, to expand our horizons and learn. The last four years I've been in the Southwest where my son Troy uh, lives and I'm fishing all of those, those canyon lakes and those deep clear water lakes and having a ball. And it's just making me a better fisherman because I'm fishing lakes and environments that I've never been on before. He learns a whole lot fishing saltwater that makes him a better freshwater fisherman. That's constantly part of the learning curve. When I'm down at Florida, I fish a lot with Dick Sternberg. We probably do 90 days, uh, I actually, out of water. Now, when I'm talking days, I'm not talking 12-hour days. These are four, five-hour days. Dick probably is out of water more than I am. He's a re he retired biologist. If I fish 200 days a year, he probably fishes 230. Uh, what keeps keeps all of us interested is the change. You know, if I had to go out there and drag Lindy rigs back trolling from a small boat with a little flasher like I did 50 years ago and do this on and on and on for the whole rest of my life, I'd probably quit fishing too. But what got me was all the innovations, all the changes, everything that's coming up. All our marketing partners, they come up with so so much new stuff. We can't, you know, we can't even get to fish all of it in a year's time. We gotta actually work at fishing it. You know, to be able to get out that often and, and fish, and, and especially days like this, it's pushing, you know, 95 out. Uh, uh, a lot of people get exhausted if you're 80 years old or so. But that just bring, br brings a thought to mind, just uh, uh, what, Ron, Ron uh, how old was Homer Circle? And, uh, Yo, Homer Circle, 97 years old. He was the former outdoor angling editor for Sports and Field for many years, and later he continued writing. He's a good friend with Glenn Lau. Homer finally passed away, and when he did, he caught a 10-pound bass with Glenn weeks before he finally gave up the ghost. Now that's my kind of guy. Look at, look at that baby. Whoa, whoa. You gotta put on one rod and stay with it, Ronald. Every, every time I set a hook, he grabs a different rod and he changes anything. Uh, there she, Alphonse, I got myself one. Boy, it took me a, a long time break. to That's a nice one catch again. up with you oh, here. Oh yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of top, top and I'm getting a little bit on that, that deeper, but hold it, baby, let me get you, all right. This one's a little bit skinny, Ron. Look, it's a nice size fish, but it's a little bit skinnier. The jig fish. Good one, though, too. You know, at the beginning of the show, we posed the question to you. You remember what that question was. Hey, do you guys ever get tired of fishing? Based on what you just seen, I'm going to let you answer that question for yourself. I think it's pretty apparent. Ronald, we got time for two more spots. Then I gotta go. Just two more spots. One more bite. How about one more cast? 